time of need. The YMCA um, was um, commissioned to provide psychological services from diagnosis right through to bereavement. Together for Short Lives have been an amazing resource for us um, and given us national clout um, and offered their expertise. The Isle of Wight NHS Trust provide staff. So we provide all the um, children's um, staff from the paediatrician with an interest in palliative care and they have increased staffing in order to provide a new respite service. Earl Batten was slow off the mark, I have to say, <laughs> and it took years of nagging, years and years of nagging, but it's paid off eventually. And Pete's gonna tell you about that now. So the Oman Batten finally listened. We heard the messages, um, and this really because of this little girl, this is our little princess called Sophie. Sophie um, in 2012 was diagnosed um, with a supratentorial high-grade glioma. Her family were very passionate about what they wanted for Sophie, as was Sophie. She was passionate about what she wanted. They didn't want to go to the mainland. They wanted to be at home. They wanted to be near a home. They wanted to be near a family. And that was really important for them. So, as I said, EMH listened. And we decided to look inside ourselves as an organization to find out why haven't we done this before? Our mission, our mission then in 2013, we are here for you and those you love, to help you live well and die at peace in the place you choose. Our vision was to lead and develop services which ensure an effective and timely response to the needs of those on our island community who lie shorting in illnesses. Surely that was Sophie. It didn't exclude her. And I would encourage you all to go back and look at your own visions and missions. And does it exclude children? So what did we do? Quite simply, we created a memorandum of understanding between us and the provider trust. That memorandum of understanding said that we could be used as a clinical setting for the delivery of end of life care for children. It didn't say that we as the hospice staff were gonna deliver that end of life care. And that's one of the key things in this. So the children's community team continue to deliver that end of life care within our hospice setting. <coughs> we also set up the notion and the idea that we could develop what we kind of call a resting service. And the idea of the resting service was that when a child has died, regardless of the place that it dies, it can come to us so that the parents can have the opportunity to spend valuable quality time before passing them into the care of the funeral directors. Obviously, this was a bit of a change of tact for our Mountbatten Hospice. So there were some practical things we had to do. We had to contact the CQC. We had to find out, was this contrary to regulations? We took their advice, but they were supportive. It was quite easy, in fact. They wanted policies, which we produced. They wanted locks on doors. They wanted safeguarding training, which we were already doing. So that wasn't too bad. Now, being a dad of two young children, I should have known this, but this was put forward to me for a potential slide. If you don't know, this is Baroness Bomburst from the film Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. The significance of this is Baroness does not like children. She abhors them. And funny enough, that was the reaction within our hospice. The notion and the concept of bringing children into our hospice uh, there was fear. There was fear for, um, for professional boundaries and for emotional boundaries. And that wasn't just for nursing staff, that was throughout staff, throughout volunteers. It also led to the island community questioning, what are we? Are we a children's hospice? Are we an adult hospice? Are we playing at something here? No, not at all. We're responding to local needs. So in 2013, Sophie died. 
in November. So it's quite poignant that two years on after Sophie's death, we're here sharing our experiences with you. That fear that was felt by the staff was very, very real. And they left it to the senior management team to get on with it. They said, if you want to do it, you do it, but we're not getting involved. So how has it, ha how has it moved on? Becky told you earlier that we expected maybe one, two children's deaths per year on the Isle of Wight. The services look very different to that. Since its implementation in November 2013, we've had six families have the offer of using our service and five have taken up the offer of having a resting service. Parents have really powerfully described the relief felt when given the choice that their child can have a choice of where they be at the time of death and after death. One of the parents described to me, and, and, and I have to confess, this is the point that I got it. Prior to this, hence the title of the, the presentation, more than just the room, I thought it was just the room. The parent told me that up until two weeks before their child died, everybody had told them that their child was gonna have treatment. In fact, there was massive fundraising campaigns on the island still to the day before he died for life-saving treatment for this child. I sat down quite openly with the dad and he said to me, do you know what? When we were given the opportunity to have you as an option, I could deal with the fact that my child was gonna die. He said, up until that point, the biggest fear that we had was what would happen after he died? What would we do? How would we hand them over into the care of a funeral director straight away? So creating that choice was so important. And this is it. This is a, an example of the room. This is a room that is used for the rest of the year by adults. It takes us about, and we got better at it, it takes us about an hour to turn the room around. And we only offer the service if we're able to, and we're quite clear in our memorandum of understanding. If we have the capacity and the ability to do it, we will. And to date, we've never not had that capacity and ability to do it. It's something that is very true to us. So we turn the room around, we put a bed settee in there, we create a little environment. I look at that photo and see it as nothing special. And I'll be honest with you, I debated whether to include the photo because I don't think it is anything special. But when the parents come in, they believe it to be special. It's more than they expected. It's not a funeral directors. We try and dress up the room with age appropriate um, decorations. We try and find out a little about the child and what they like. And clearly this little girl liked Frozen like many little girls do at the moment. Um, but this room has created something very different to what we expected. We expected that the service was going to be used more for end of life care. And what's happened is that hasn't happened. By somehow creating that choice, what it's enabled is for parents to have the courage to have their child die at home. It's created a safety net for them. It's created something that they can come and have a little sanctuary for a few days before handing their child over to the care of a funeral director. It's created a sanctuary that We've heard so much about social media today and how important that, 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 that plays in life nowadays. Within an hour of these children dying, social media is recognising and sending messages to these parents. In our little sanctuary, they can choose whether they look at that. They don't have to answer the door to neighbours. So this service, it's challenged the very purpose and identity of our organisation. It's tested our emotional resilience. However, it's shown that the Isle Mountbatten Hospice has the ability to be innovative and responsive to local needs.